Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton, and this is my weekly economic outlook. It's the 111th, more or less consecutive one. Now, 111 uh, is, as some of you may know, called a Nelson in cricket, and it's considered to be a very unlucky number. I don't know if it's unlucky for me, but it's actually a bit sad, since I, I really do believe that the global conjuncture, which is a term that economists like to use, is just about as ghastly as I can remember in an adult professional life that I guess stretches back now to the early 1970s. These weekly videos tend to focus on the immediate economic and financial and I guess increasingly geopolitical developments on all three counts. Uh, I have to say that last week was a doozy. But let me begin with a very broad brush pricey of where I think we stand on these three counts, on the economy, on finance, and on geopolitics, and why I'm so worried about each. First, inevitably, geopolitics. It, it, it doesn't take a Clausewitz or a Hermann Kahn or even a Kissinger to see that the current state of play is absolutely terrifying. Anybody who's seen any of these videos before knows my view about the Ukraine war, but it's worth repeating, I think. First, I think there is no doubt, that, well, there is no doubt that Putin is the aggressor, but it's also worth remembering that the eastern Ukraine was part not just of the Soviet Union, but of Russia for a thousand years. Indeed, the first capital of Russia was Kiev. Second, it's worth remembering that Reagan and Jim Baker pretty much promised the Kremlin that Russia would have a free hand in what uh, it called its near abroad after the fall of the Soviet Union, and that we, that is, we in the West, would not try to move the West's military alliance up against the Russian border, as we subsequently did. And third, it's worth remembering that Putin's, that prior to Putin's invasion, Ukraine was pretty much universally considered either the most corrupt and ill-governed state in Europe or the second most corrupt only to Russia. Indeed, Zelensky, who is now genuinely a hero, was until Russia gave him the opportunity to rise to the occasion little more than the stooge of a, shall we say, rather controversial Ukrainian-Israeli oligarch called Igor Kolomaisky. I think it's also worth remembering that despite the 40 billion plus of US military aid and the latest 450 million package that was approved uh, by the White House last week, Ukraine is not actually winning. Yes, Putin's plan A failed and probably his plan B failed as well. But plan C, which seems to be uh, to concentrate on the east and south of the country, seems to be working, albeit it's working very slowly. Don't underestimate Ukraine's losses, particularly its losses in terms of manpower. Russia is much more capable of absorbing those, those casualties than the Ukraine is, not least because Russia's casualties tend to be military, while Ukrainian casualties are increasingly civilian. And on top of all that, don't forget that the cost of reconstruction when the war does come to an end, as I guess it eventually will do, will be enormous, perhaps 100 billion or more. And while the US has made most of its assistance, military or otherwise, in the form of grants, other countries, including the UK, have advanced their assistance as loans. I see no happy outcome since I can't see how even a victorious Ukraine, whatever that means, will ever be able to service those loans. One other thing, I've noticed that the further away Ukraine's friends are, the more bellicose they are, admittedly with the exception of the Poles, where the overwhelming majority still want to punish the Russians. But in the US, for instance, the Biden administration is forever talking tough and berating the Germans, the Italians and the French for backsliding. Same with our own prime minister. But in Germany in particular, 
the latest threat by Gazprom to close the Nord Stream 1 pipeline completely, allegedly for maintenance, makes the prospect of energy rationing and individual plant shutdowns all too real. Same in Austria, same in Italy, same even in the Netherlands. Continental Europe is in the front line of this particular war. And the US and to a lesser extent the UK are a lot further away from the action. Well, what's the best outcome? No surprise that I'm in Kissinger camp, uh, believing that Putin has to be given some sort of an off-ramp, something that he can show to the Russian people as if not, not as a victory, but at least not as an abject defeat. If that means recognition of Russia's control of Crimea, for instance, fine. If it means a rigged plebiscite in the Donbass, well, that's sad, maybe sad for the inhabitants, but it's better than nuclear war. As the wise old former neocon Edward Lutwak put it in an interview last week, which I urge you to read if you haven't done already, I think it's called Three Blind Kings. The least bad outcome would be what he calls, and I quote, a dirty contemptible compromise. Better that than nuclear war. However, in the short term, I don't see much light in the tunnel, or certainly not at the end of it. Indeed, I know that the telegraphs normally say in Con Coughlin, were warned last week that, again, I quote, Britain must be prepared to go to war with Russia. And that message seems to resonate right across the political spectrum in the UK, all the way from Notting Hill to Islington. It also seems to be resonating with G7 leaders at their current Bavarian summit. I note that the draft communique apparently refers to indefinite support for Ukraine, as well as for new sanctions, including a ban on trading Russian gold uh, and possibly some sort of cap on the price of Russian exports, especially oil. We'll, we'll see. Meanwhile, I think there are two things that uh, need to be watched. The first is something called the Suvalsky Gap, the 120 mile corridor through Lithuanian territory linking the Russian enclave of Kaliningrad, formerly Königsberg, with Moscow's ally Belarus. If Lithuania, which is, uh, has been more or less um, in line with the Poles on, on Russia, if, Ukraine, if Lithuania is serious about cl closing it, closing the Suvalsky gap to Russian traffic, even using EU sanctions as an excuse, I fear that we are in deep, deep trouble. Second, debt. The grace period on a foreign currency $100 interest payment expired yesterday. If, as today's press suggests, Russia didn't pay, and if the London court subsequently determined that this constitutes a formal default, as they may well do so, we could have a financial crisis to add to a geopolitical crisis as other creditors start to call in their loans, as they may well be legally able to do. But of course, it, it's not just Ukraine that we have to worry about. Ghastly though the Ukrainian situation is, and devastating though it has been to energy and food markets, to global supply chains uh, in Europe and beyond, and indeed to the whole concept of economic and financial globalization. There's also China, which you may have noticed, hosted a virtual meeting of the BRICS group last week, at, at which to Washington's shock horror, no one, absolutely no one condemned Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and everyone continued to apparently want a slice of China's largesse. Most of us in the West uh, tend to think that China's Belt and Road Initiative, the BRI, is a busted flush. And we look at what's happening in, for instance, Sri Lanka as a cautionary tale. But for most countries in the global South, including some very big ones, China is still seen as a source of capital that is cheaper, uh, and that comes with a lot fewer strings attached than aid from the United States or the World Bank or the IMF, or even from bilateral lenders like the UK or the EU. In other words, 
despite Xi's, Xi Jinping's manifestly incompetent handling of the domestic COVID epidemic, and despite the experience of countries like Sri Lanka, China can still count on the support of most of the global South in any conflict with the US hegemon, something that may well be tested fairly soon in the South China Sea. I note that the G7's pledge uh, the, the, the G7 has pledged to set up a global in infrastructure fund to rival, allegedly, the Belt and Road Initiative. But first of all, at $600 million, it would be tiny in comparison with the BRI. And secondly, somehow I doubt that the terms that it will lend under and the conditions that it will attach will be competitive with China's, shall we say, flexibility. And then there's Iran. Um, I see that over the weekend, Josep Borrell, uh, the EU's foreign policy czar, uh, has said that he's hoping to restart the JCPOA, that is the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. The JCPOA talks on Iran's nuclear program sometime soon, perhaps in the next couple of weeks. That's a schedule that um, could well coincide with the emergence or the re-emergence of that Arch hawk Benjamin Netanyahu as a political force in Israel, which is great timing. And don't expect Biden to help. Uh, this is election season in the United States, and making concessions to the mullahs in Tehran doesn't win any votes on either the east or the west coast of the United States. Uh, therefore, I have to think this remains a scarier flashpoint as it was pre-pandemic. One could go on. At a global level, this weekend's G7 summit in, in Germany was obviously hijacked by the Ukrainian war, even though the US had apparently wanted to use it to build a more effective coalition against China. I've already noted the, that I fear meaningless pledge of 600 billion, actually, I think I said million before, 600 billion uh, for a global infrastructure program. But the fact is that the Biden administration and the Western alliance, which came together after uh, February the 24th, are starting to fray. That, I think, brings us to domestic politics. I regret having a view on this. Uh, confronted with these geopolitical problems, the like of which we haven't really seen for a generation, uh, and as I'll discuss economic, uh, in the face of economic and financial threats that are almost as bad as those, we find almost every significant Western politician in deep domestic doo-doo. A quick tour d'horizon. Let's let me start with the US, where Biden's personal poll numbers are little short of catastrophic. The latest job approval polls, for instance, which I just saw yesterday, uh, have his negatives anywhere between 18 percentage points and 25 percentage points. That's the margin between approve and disapprove. No one, but no one wants him to be the Democratic nominee again in 2024, not least because he would be 86 by the end of a second term. That, does, that doesn't work even in China, and it certainly wouldn't work in the US. Not surprisingly, given, however, given that he still insists that he will run, the Democrats have genuinely been in despair until and until now it had, in my opinion, been a racing certainty that the Republicans would break the Democrats' hold on Congress in the midterm elections in November. However, everything may have changed. The Supreme Court's decision, which I guess was expected, but nonetheless came as a shock, the Su Supreme Court's decision to reverse Roe versus Wade may, and I use the word advisedly, may give the Democrats a huge boost. The problem, however, is that abortion, like race, is an issue in the US that people are very reluctant to speak about openly or truthfully. Uh, that said, I think it is clear that the US media, even the more moderate media, is overwhelmingly offended by this decision, which it contends overturns what was previously settled law. 
I think it's also true that Americans on the East and West Coast are equally outraged, though I have to say they almost all live in blue states, which will be relatively unaffected by putting the decision back to individual state legislatures. And it is true that younger Americans, younger Americans are also upset, but by and large, they don't vote. Now, I haven't yet seen a poll that has been taken after the court's decision, but previous polls tended to show something that was a bit counterintuitive. They tended to show that the country is actually split 50-50 on this issue and that it probably won't have that much impact on voting patterns, whatever the New York Times or, or for that matter, even the Financial Times says. The problem, as I see it, however, is that the Supreme Court may not be able to keep its mouth shut. Uh, indeed, there are stories, um, I don't know how accurate they are, that Clarence Thomas, uh, who, along with Sam Alito, is one of the more conservative judges, even though he's, he's the only black judge on the panel, wants the court to tackle two other equally settled issues, contraception, and same-sex marriage. Now, that, I think, really would be a bridge too far, a bridge that the court shouldn't even be thinking about uh, crossing. If Thomas doesn't keep his mouth shut, he risks a political attack on the judiciary, the like of which we haven't seen in a 100 years. <laughs> Believe it or not, talk of civil war is now quite widespread, even in the sane press in the United States. It's still it has to be, it's still hyperbole, but we're in a situation in which uh, the no compromise is possible uh, within the US polity on the biggest social issues of the day, not just abortion or sexual behavior in general, but race, gender, crime, the right to bear arms, you name it. I read a piece a few weeks ago, I, th I think it was in the New York Times, warning that it is now inconceivable that there could be a peaceful change of government, either on Capitol Hill or in the White House, with a change of government without violence. I fear that, insane though that sounds, it's true. So, post Russia, uh, sorry, post Roe. Uh, Roe versus Wade. I don't know where the US political scene is going. I was pretty confident that the Republicans would win the House and might well take back the Senate in November, but it's now very much up for grabs. As for the presidential nomination in nominations, plural, in 2024, well, on the Democratic side, Kamala Harris is still said to be the front runner, assuming that is that Biden doesn't run, but no one no one thinks she'll get it. Uh, the general sense is that she is the weakest vice president, probably since Spiro Agnew. But if she doesn't get the nod for the Democrats, who will? The current favorite is uh, the transportation secretary, Pete Buttigieg. But given the, who, the current hoo-ha within the Supreme Court and indeed with society, within American society more generally, are the Americans really ready for a male president with a, quote, first husband? Well, as for the Republicans, the Democrats are continuing to push Trump as the Republicans' uh, nominee. Um, and I can see the logic behind that. After all, 60% of Republicans would die for him, which means that he can get the nomination if he tries for it, but he could never, never win a general election because 40% of Republicans hate him even more than they hate the Democrats. So who else? Well, the smart money seems to be going to Florida's Ron DeSantis, Harvard educated, smart, but, you know, appealing to the same uh, parts of the Republican Party that, uh, that, re that uh, Trump appeals to, but perhaps less, quite less toxically. Uh, but we'll see. What about Europe? Well, in Germany, Chancellor Scholz is having, shall we say, an increasingly tough time holding his SPD, Green, FDP coalition together, not least because the Greens, who, by the way, are much the most bellicose of the three parties when it comes to the war in Ukraine, are having to swallow energy policies that are 180 degrees opposed to everything that they have ever stood for, in particular, the reopening of coal-fired and lignite-fired power plants to keep German industry humming through the winter. 
Now, I'm astonished that neither Annalena Baerbach nor Robert Habeck has yet resigned, but they must be under pressure from their own party's rank and file to do so. Meanwhile, in France, well, President Macron is trying to come to grips with legislative elections that were far worse than, uh, for him anyway, far worse than almost any poll had suggested. Yes, he will probably be able to cobble together uh, a majority in the National Assembly uh, on a case-by-case -case basis with the help of the centre-right Republicans and with the help of his former friend or his former Prime Minister, Edouard Philippe's little group of Conservatives. But it will be on a case-by-case -case basis, which means that there will be no major changes to the retirement age or to pensions, or frankly, any economic policies that are difficult. Instead, I think there'll be a lot of airy-fairy foreign policy initiatives like the proposal for a European political community, a sort of EU light that he unveiled at last week's European Council meeting, admittedly to fairly withering criticism from friend and foe alike. We'll see more of that. As for here in the UK, well, I suppose the big issue is whether Tory MPs can use the forthcoming elections to the 1922 committee to change the rule that currently forbids another challenge to Johnson's leadership for the next, I think, 11 months. I guess it depends, first of all, how desperate those red wall Tory MPs feel and Actually, they must feel pretty damn desperate. And whether a plausible successor is willing to put his or her head above the parapet. Well, I guess at the moment, the favourite to do so, at least the media favourite, is still Jeremy Hunt, though whether he would have any more credibility uh, than Boris does in long lit air profonde, I doubt. A multimillionaire, son of an admiral, won't go down too well with in Rotherham or the Calder Valley. But that's just politics. On the economic side, almost all the advanced economies, with the admittedly notable exception of Japan, currently confront a builabes of connected problems, including first and foremost a recurrence of inflation, partly caused by the Ukraine war, but more fundamentally, the product of the profligate use of monetary policy during the pandemic, pumping cheap or, for that matter, free money into the economy on a hitherto unimaginable scale. Second, a very real and I think growing fear that the response of the monetary authorities, that is primarily the central banks, to this upsurge in inflation uh, will tip what was a fairly weak post-COVID economic recovery into an out-and-out -out recession, or perhaps something even worse than a recession. And third, as an almost inevitable corollary to the other two worries, that there will be a market bust, the like of which we haven't seen for years. Well, let's bring this up to date with what was happening over the last week or so. While uh, as far as most economists and central bankers are concerned, inflation is, or at least should be, the number one priority. The bigger story, the even bigger story last week, has been the fear of recession, which is now pretty palpable on both sides of the Atlantic. In Europe, it's now almost universally acknowledged that a recession defined as two quarters of negative growth, two consecutive quarters of negative growth, will begin not later than the fourth quarter of this year. In the US, the latest survey of Wall Street economists by the Wall Street Journal, which they, they do every quarter, suggested that there is a 44% chance of a recession in the next 12 months. That's up from 28% in the journal's April survey and 18% in January. Given that Wall Street economists have stopped to sell, that's a pretty damn devastating increase in pessimism. That said, however, uh, the latest flash, that's the preliminary S&P purchasing managers indices for June, don't necessarily support that pessimism. True, the PMIs are slowing almost everywhere except Japan, but they are still above 50 
uh, which is the cutoff between growth and uh, contraction in almost all the advanced economies. Still, the sentiment on growth has shifted and it's now very definitely turned negative. And I guess one can see why. In, in the US, for instance, it was reported last week that existing home sales, which are a really important indicator, fell 3.4% in May, that the Michigan Confidence Index, which for some reason is very closely watched by market players, fell from 58.4 to 58 last month, and that both the Chicago Fed survey and the Kansas City Fed's activity indices slumped in May there. On the other hand, there are counter indicators, particularly as far as the US labor market is concerned, it's still very, very tight, but the needle has clearly shifted in favor of a sharp slowdown and indeed a recession. That's even more true in Europe where the problem is compounded uh, by, the, by being in the front line and the war uh, that's going on in Ukraine. Um, there's also increasing divergence in economic, in relative economic performance within the Eurozone in particular. The best indicator of that, I think, is interest rate spreads, which have widened sharply in some of the southern European countries. Italian 10 year spreads are now 211 basis points over German bunds not as high as the 230 basis points in Greece, but worryingly high given the cost of servicing Italian debt, much of which is short term and therefore is affected by the changes in uh, policy rates. Now, again, economic indicators in Europe are not all negative, but at the Eurozone level, it was reported last week that the Consumer confidence index fell in June from an already low minus 21.1 to minus 23.6. More important, perhaps, the IFO, that's the IFO survey in Germany, which is closely watched by the market, fell across the board with the business climate index down, the current conditions index down, and the expectations index down as well. As for here in the UK, well, the big news last week was that the CBI's industrial orders index fell sharply in June, as did its distributive trades index. It was also reported that GFK's consumer confidence index hit a record low in June and that retail sales volumes were down 0.5% last month or by 4.7% year on year, though in nominal terms they were actually still up, but that's only because of inflation. So what about inflation? Well, it wasn't a big week for price data, particularly in Europe, but it was reported that in Germany, the PPI, that's the producer price index, was up 33.6% year on year in May, and that here in the UK, the CPI, the consumer price index, hit 9.1% with the producer price index at 15.7%, and the retail price index, which is still used for all sorts of things, is now 11.7%. Even in Japan, inflation is becoming a little bit of an issue. It's now around 2.5%, which is, I guess, super high by recent standards. So what should be done? Well, possibly the most important single event of last week on the economic side was Fed Chairman Powell's two days of what used to be called Humphrey Hawkins' testimony to Congress, in which he tried to lay out the Fed's priorities and positions. Now, this is, this is genuinely a puzzle to me. As I read reports of what he said in his testimony and in the subsequent press conference, Powell was unequivocal. He, Quote, we have to get inflation down. He emphasized that the Fed's commitment to inflation was, quote, unequivocal, which I take to mean that the Fed will prioritize inflation over growth no matter what the Biden administration or Congress thinks. The same line was picked up by other senior Fed officials, but to my surprise, the market seemed to have drawn the opposite conclusion. They feel that the Fed has pulled back on its plans for aggressive interest rate increases. Personally, I doubt it, but we'll see. 
What is fairly clear is that there has been a shift in Fed th the Fed's own thinking about inflation. It's now less concerned with what it calls core inflation. That is, uh, that was always its priority and more concerned with inflationary expectations. In that sense, I would expect it to be more aggressive, not less, since expectations are very hard to drive down. In the meantime, the only relief that American consumers are likely to get on the inflation front is a temporary suspension of the federal gas excise tax on gasoline, which is 18 cents per US gallon, uh, though I doubt that the companies will be inclined to pass all of it on. All of this ought to have had an impact on financial markets, and I guess it has done. In the FX markets, for instance, there's been an 8.6% rise in the trade-weighted value of the dollar since the beginning of the year. Now, that's a very substantial shift indeed. The dollar is now up 7.3% year to date against the euro, 9.3% against sterling, 4.9% against the Swiss franc, which is the only other acceptable safe haven currency, and a hefty 17.4% against the yen, which actually hit a 24-year low of 136.7 yen to the dollar on Wednesday before it bounced a bit. Just about the only major currency that has beaten the dollar over the last couple of months is da -da -da -dum, the Russian ruble. After the invasion of uh, Ukraine began at the end of February, it hit, it hit a low of around 130 rubles to the dollar. And most people, me included, felt that it would fall even further. I couldn't see any reason for it not to. In fact, higher oil prices and, and I guess an admittedly very painful slump in Russian imports have actually pushed it up. And it is currently, despite two cuts in domestic interest rates, up another 4.4% week on week to around 54 rubles to the dollar. Though whether that's realistic as a rate, an actual rate at which you can change money is, I guess, open to doubt. I note the near panic among unrepentant Brexit British, Bre British Remainers about the weakness of sterling. If you read and if you believe the Financial Times, there is a sterling crisis underway. And the former Treasury Permanent Secretary, Nicholas McPherson, seems to have been bigging this up. But in my opinion, a 2% fall against the euro since the beginning of this year is no crisis. Indeed, it, it's probably a pretty good thing, given that the EU is still our biggest export market. What we have is not a sterling crisis, but a dollar crisis. And a crisis because quite clearly funk money is flooding into the dollar and driving US bond yields down despite the Fed's rhetoric, regardless of the damage that that might do to the US economy or to the US balance of payments. Now, I'm not going to say anything, or at least not very much, about Bitcoin this, this, this week, or indeed about cryptos in general, not least because with the SEC's uh, witch finder general, Gary Gensler, now on the case and taking an interest in the crypto market, it's hard to see that they have much more upside. Bitcoin did indeed break $18,000 to the downside 10 days ago, but it appears to have stabilized for the moment at somewhere around $21,000. Uh, what fascinates me is how long those bedroom warriors who have been uh, funding their crypto had habit with zero interest rate money are going to go on trading as interest rates notch higher. I know rates are still deeply negative in real terms, but for uh, traders, it's nominal rates that matter, and uh, they are clearly on the increase. Now, as for equities, well, a couple of weeks ago, I, like many other economists, felt vindicated on both sides of the Atlantic stocks had sold off sharply, pushing almost all the major indices down into bear market territory. I, like many others, expected that to continue, not least because the cost of carry was rising and hurting, because political risk is increasing, and because stocks 
almost everywhere around the world are still way outside their historical ranges in terms of PE ratios and other value measures. I was wrong. Last week, equity markets bounced. They are still down year to date, but week on week, the Dow was the Dow Jones Industrial Average, for instance, was up 5.4%. The S&P 500, the broader S&P 500, was up 6.5%, and the tech-heavy Nasdaq was up 7.5%. In Europe, it's true the Zetra DAX in Germany was down, but it was down around 0.1%, uh, and that, after all, does reflect the fact that Germany's especially vulnerable to what's been going on in Ukraine and Russia. But the, the FTSE 100 here in the UK was up 2.7%, and the Cap 40 in Paris was up 3.2%. Further afield, the Nikkei 225 was up 2%, and even the Hang Seng in Hong Kong was up 3.1%. So what do macroeconomists like me know? Well, I feel pretty sure that uh, there will have been the correction that most economists have been predicting for the last couple of years. It's just that we tend to get our timing wrong. That's why we're poor and the hedges are rich. Anyway, thanks for watching.